Qatar's release of eight Indian Navy veterans who were sentenced to death on espionage charges has marked a significant diplomatic breakthrough between India and Qatar. India swiftly mobilized diplomatic channels and legal assistance to secure the release of the veterans after expressing deep shock at their death sentence by Qatar's court of first instance. The Ministry of External Affairs pledged to explore all legal options and move the Court of Appeal in Qatar against the verdict. Amidst pleas from their families, the MEA assured to assist in their safe return culminating in a successful diplomatic intervention by New Delhi. The release personnel include Captain Navtet Singh Gill, Captain Saurabh Vashisht, Commander Purnendu Tiwari, Captain Birender Kumar Verma, Commander Sugunakar Pakala, Commander Sanjeev Gupta, Commander Amit Nagpal and Sailor Ragesh. They are distinguished careers in the Indian Navy with some receiving awards for excellence. As these eight Navy veterans are now rescued, PM Modi is also all set to visit Qatar on the 14th of February after his visit to Dubai. Joining us live at this point is Commodore Anil Jay Singh, former Navy officer. We also have uh, Major General Sudhakar Ji, geopolitical analyst joining us live. Major General Dhruv Katoch, defense expert joins us live. Sumit Peer, political commentator is also with us on the broadcast. Let me uh, begin with you first. Uh, Sumit Peer. Sumit, what all has transpired behind the do uh, doors and behind the curtains uh, in these efforts to bring home the veterans? It's not something which happened overnight or was easy was it Sumit? Uh, Oday, thank you very much for having me on your show. First of all, there's a moment to celebrate. Congratulations to 1.4 billion people and especially Prime Minister Modi, PMO, HMO and MEA. They have done relentless work and our ambassador there of course can't, can't you know miss him out of this. You know Oday, first of all this was never a case. There was no espionage, nothing. This Dara consultancy was run by Omani National. He got in touch with our people. He said, we want to build some submarine ops for Oma, you know, Qatar. Please come up. So Navy officers joined him. They gave their identity. They gave their name, pata, passport, everything. They made the full disclosure who they are. They land up there. Suddenly one day they picked up saying, okay, okay you are doing some espionage. Then this, this Omani National is let off. The person who got them there, the person who owns the company, the person who was behind everything was let off. Now, these people are put in solitary confinement. We are not told what happened. Then suddenly in the peak of this Israel-Hamas conflict, suddenly we are told they are spying for Israel. Because in the Arabic world, you know, if you spy for Israel, it's a, it's an unwarranted death. Now, nobody will ask a question. Nobody will raise a finger. Then suddenly we come to know on a Thursday evening, oh, there is going to be death sentence and the deaths in, you know, Qatar happens by firing by, you know, oh, firing squad. No, when this happened on a Thursday night, it was a diplomatic fiasco to happen, uh, you know, handle and it was something which we were unprepared for because our people have nothing to do. Why would we spy for Mossad? Why would we declare I am a commander of this and go and spy for anybody? Then I will hide my identity. So under prima facie, I believe ISI, Turkish intelligence and even some elements from Iran might be involved in this. I am sure about ISI and Turkish intelligence. They were trying to plot it. It was a geopolitical thing which they were trying to put Prime Minister Modi in a dock. They were trying to put his government on the dock. And what happened here? Immediately, people started jumping. Bhai, kya hua? Chapan ki chati kahan gai? Jugya Modi, Bigya Modi. They started all that drama. You are not getting our veterans back. This is how Indians are treated. This is how our decorated officers are treating. Now, the same set of people, you know, who said this, will they come and apologize to and No. What did the commander Saab said today? I, I I watched his video. He said, I'm thankful to the government of India and the intervention of Prime Minister Bodhi. We are back. In Islamic world, you commute somebody to death. Then first you have to stop the death sentence and then you get them back. It's a 360 degree turn. And I remember that day, on that night, there was a press release by HMO, which said this matter will be handled confidentially. Then I was relieved because they are not talking much about it. Something is happening because usually when PMO, HMO and MEA get involved and all the, you know, our friends and all in UAE and Arab and all Saudis and all get involved, there is something which they are cooking. You tell me in independent India, when has this happened? Which other country has been able to do this? Which other nation has been able to do it? Forget the death sentence, forget the prison. Now today our veterans are home and they are saying, Bharat Mata ki jai. This can only happen in Modi tenure. I say to Modi, if Modi is possible, otherwise, if it's a UPA and some other government, you can kiss it goodbye. Kuch nahi hone wala tha. Kuch nahi hone wala tha. We would have lost our eight people. And see the amount of pressure which was created. Modi ji talked to Nawaz Sharif. Modi ji talked to Kutkata. Talk, do this, do this, do that. And all kinds of fiascos, all kinds of geopolitical pressure, international pressure, domestic pressure was created. But the government was calm and composed. And this morning when they announced it, I didn't believe my eyes. I tried to check it at, you know, a couple of places when I saw the news. 
I say, how come this is possible? This is like a miracle. This is like a magic happening. And Uday, nobody could have thought that we'll get them back in two months' time on our soil, free and you know, free and good. That is what we should appreciate. This is a great win. This is when all the functions of the government work together. And let's not forget the personal equation of Prime Minister Modi with the Amir of Qatar. And Qatar knows India is a superpower in emerging, emerging superpower. We need Indians. We need Indian business. 840 diaspora, 840,000, Hindustani. Then you need our business. Then you need our stature. And if you look at the geopolitics, Pakistan is all-time low. Turkey is all-time low. Iran is all-time low. What are you holding back to us? You cannot use our naval officers, our decorated officers as pawns of geopolitical game. And India has the stature, it right. has the might to get its people back. We have shown that to the world. It is not only Israel who can do it, India can do it and without firing a bullet and without spilling a drop of blood. That is what is the Modi magic and that is what this government has done, Odai. Odai. All right. Uh, let me, in fact, uh, take that straight across to uh, uh, Kamra Anil Jai Singh as well. Uh, Anil Jai Singh, uh, you know, for the Navy uh, fraternity, which you belong to, uh, you know, how do you view this new news? How has this news been received? Uh, and... Uh, you know, the efforts, how is the fraternity seeing these efforts that have gone in to actually bring these veterans back and save them from what, uh, you know, the Qataris were trying to do? No, it is indeed a very remarkable turnaround from what we experienced two or three months ago when they were handed the death sentence. In fact, that took everybody by, by uh, not even surprise, I think shock. And that really got, I think, the government machinery moving and realizing that this situation is far, far more serious and far worse than then we had probably anticipated. These people had been working in Qatar for some time. They were training Qatari Navy personnel. It had nothing to do with Qatari submarines, as was just brought out. Qatari submarines is a separate program altogether, which is happening wherever it's happening. These officers, none of them are submariners. They were regular naval officers, all of them with very distinguished track records. And they, after retirement, it was not that they were doing something surreptitious. They very, very legitimately took up a job, were assigned to the Qatari, to train the Qatari Navy properly, in a proper legal manner, in a fully transparent manner. And that is why the fact that when they were picked up and put in solitary confinement, it took everyone by surprise about a year ago. And since then, of course, a lot of effort was being made back channel also to get things done. But things things apparently went from bad to worse and they got the death sentence. And I think that is when really the the diplomatic and the, and the complete government machinery swung into action. Personal equations at the highest level were, were, were used as we just brought out, the Prime Minister personally intervened. The External Affairs Minister was very sort of uh, alive to the situation. He was interacting with the families on a regular basis. The Navy itself, the Navy had a role to play in the background because navies don't really, are not the instruments of, you know, getting this kind of thing done. But after all, they were ex-naval officers, so the Navy was equally concerned. We had meetings with the families. We met the Chief of Naval Staff. All that happened. Uh, things were moving within. Navy was doing its back-channel diploma, trying to, you know, uh, trying to... Uh, uh, get things done at the at the diplomatic level, and I think uh, like this brought like this like it was just brought out. I think everybody put their act together very effectively, starting from the prime minister downwards to lead to this uh, situation where all of these seven of the eight officers are back on Indian soil. The eighth one will also be back. It's just a procedural delay, I think, in in his, in his arrival. And I think it, the families. I met the families a couple of times. They were devastated when the death sentence was announced. Understandably so. I mean, we've known them. We've been we've been colleagues together. It was terrible to sort of interact with them and, and, and you know, realize their anguish and see their anguish. And I think today they all must be very relieved. They've, their friends have gone and met them. Uh, we've seen on on social media, on WhatsApp, naval groups, course mates are going and meeting them. Families are getting together. There's a lot of uh, joy in every family, uh, obviously so. And I'm glad that this saga has finally come to an end most satisfactorily. And I think this speaks does speak volumes for India's, firstly, deaf diplomacy. It's, uh, it's well, more or less, I won't say to use the word clout, but it's certainly being able to influence events in a much larger sort of area of interest. And of course, uh, you know, our, our growing stature as a country does help. So I'm, I personally, as a naval officer, I'm very glad they're back. This thing is behind them. And hopefully everything from here will move smoothly forward. Yes, uh, obviously, it's, it's not something, though, uh, Major General Dhruv Katoch, that happened overnight, is it? Uh, it's something that, that took a lot of effort, that took a lot of back-channel dialogue, uh, yes. diplomacy intervention, uh, and also perhaps intervention at the very top uh, from the PM as well, Major General Katoch. What all do you believe has happened to secure this release and achieve this day? 
Uh, thank you, Uday. Uday, as far as intervention is concerned, I think without the topmost intervention of the Prime Minister of India, uh, we wouldn't have got this result in this time frame. But uh, having said that, it was not simply just the Prime Minister, it was the entire PMO, the MEA, the uh, Minister of External Affairs, uh, the Home Ministry, uh, the Indian Navy. And I think there must have been other channels too. But it, it, was, it was required because uh, on, on multiple grounds. I think the first ground we must understand is they were, they were uh, prosecuted on charges of spying. Now, that is the most absurd charge possible because no person in his right mind will send eight people to, uh, to spy on a, training, uh, on a training mission, all of them together. Uh, I, I, you, you know, it boggles the imagination. So this was a setup. It was a setup operation, um, most probably uh, done by uh, the Pakistani ISI. The Turks could be involved. We really don't know. The truth will come out. The truth can never be hidden. That is one. Number two, when we look at the um, when you look at the release, it is not a pardon. Remember, the pardon would have been an admission of guilt. So the Emir would have pardoned them, and that would have been an admission of guilt. They're okay, you are guilty, but I'm still pardoning you. But for the Emir also to pardon eight individuals, I think would have reflected in a very adverse manner on his leadership. So what has actually happened? The highest court in Qatar, the court of cassation, as they call it. It doesn't look into the merits of the case. It looks into the procedural aspects. And here they found that the procedural aspects or whatever aspects they would have looked into were flawed and hence the release. Now, this release sets forth many things. One, it, uh, it sends a signal to both India and Qatar that your relationships are in pretty solid ground. Number two, as far as the Emir of Qatar is concerned, His Excellency has been... Um, let us say, put out of his predicament. Uh, predicament. He no longer has to uh, give a pardon, which he would have liked to do had the relationship, because uh, it is not worth uh, sacrificing eight men of India to spoil the relationship between India and, uh, and Qatar. Uh, the Emir wouldn't have done that. So I think it has worked out well for, for all concerned, the, the manner in which it has been executed. But let's also understand, I think there is a realization worldwide now that India is a growing power. Yes, we are the fifth largest economy, but we are we are going upwards. The trajectory is upwards. And as far as the heft of the prime minister is concerned, he is a renowned statesman in the world. It is not simply confined to India. So when you look at the stature, when you look at people talking abroad, whether you're talking to somebody in uh, Africa, whether the person is in Europe or in Singapore or elsewhere in Asia, you find they say one thing, they have great appreciation for the Prime Minister of India. And when the Prime Minister lends his voice to a particular situation, I think the world listens. And in this case, I'm very glad that the Emir of Kuwait, uh, who has a good relationship with the Prime Minister of India, uh, they, they listened. Uh, it was a very justifiable case. And the last point which I want to bring out is, I think we need to go further now, further on to this, you see, Get into the backdrop, into the background of this conspiracy. Who was behind it? I hope the Kuwaiti authorities get behind this conspiracy, uh, behind this conspiracy. And if the Pakistanis or anybody else is involved, I think that uh, the the uh, the openness should ensure that the world comes to know this is what happened, and the people involved are prosecuted in due course of time. Uday. All right. Let me uh, take that across to. Uh... Uh, our other guests as well. Let me take that across to Major Sudhakar ji as well. Major Sudhakar ji, now, uh, what do you believe? Uh, you know this. This. How do you believe this? Uh, you know this decision, this relief should be read diplomatically, uh, and what does it really say? The way we've managed this of India Qatar relations currently. Uh, Buddha, good evening. Thank you for getting me to your show. <clears throat> I, I mean, I am left with nothing. Everything has been covered by the the previous co-panelists. Mm -hmm. And uh, But let me just give a perspective to everything. You see, uh, conspiracy is well established. Whether it is ISI or somebody else, that also is well established. You see, uh, as I look at things, the geopolitics and the geoeconomics, now the geosecurity panning out world over, I, I find, I suspect that there is an angle of China. The elephant in the room is China. So uh, just the sequence of event which is given by the coordinator in the news item, they actually uh, uh, point a finger 
to you know uh, putting pressure on India, putting pressure on the leadership of the hierarchy, and uh, to downside <clears throat> the level of confidence of our honourable Prime Minister and his dispensation. That is one angle. Second thing that I wish to highlight, I myself I have been a nomad um, for as a president and CEO of a multinational company. Uh, it's very difficult. It is simply next to impossible to get anybody out who's been sentenced or given a death sentence. Uh, and these countries, they practice Sharia law. So, and in the kind of a time frame it has happened, I I don't think one particular individual would have actually led to this particular successful release. There is a collective participation and involvement led by the Honorable Prime Minister himself. So, if you look at Qatar, Today, the best friend of Qatar are two countries, if I have to prioritize. One is US, the second is UK. And fortunately, India enjoys best of relations or at least better relations than what it had in the past with both the countries. Apart from that, the Indian diaspora also play a very, very important role. Like uh, Sumit has brought out, my knowledge suggests that there are about 7, seven lakh or so. He is saying 8.42. And if that be the figure, out of 9 million population, Indian diaspora in Middle East, we have almost close to 8.5 lakh people in Qatar itself. But more than anything else, you see, every nation will take an action based on its national interest. What is the national interest of Qatar as in today? A few, I think, a couple of months back, we had fallen apart with Qatar on some issue. But same country today is looking for the trade for the commercial activities, for the gas, the liquid natural gas that we are importing from Qatar today is approximately 35% of the total energy security. And it is likely to go up in due course of time. As on today, uh, total percentage comes to 6.2%. By 2030, we are looking at a target of almost about uh, 15%. 15% mixture of the energy security so as to uh, reduce the the emission factor so as to go in for the targets that we have set for ourselves. If this is the kind of target we are looking at for import. And what does India export? India exports nothing except for the jewelry. Yes, in due bus, about seven to ten odd years, we had exported rice. Qatar is to be rice and wheat. But uh, besides that, and if you look at the trade imbalance which we have, it is highly against India's favor, highly against India's favor. So all these things, actually, it's a win-win kind of a thing which has happened. Plus, I think there is a bigger geostrategic issue that uh, has uh, come about, panned out after G20, the leadership quality, the credibility of India, and today's multipolarity the world over. There is only one country which can bring peace to the West Asia, that is India. There is only one country which can actually lead by the finger of, uh, I would say, rules-based order. Unfortunately, I'm using this articulation. The rules-based international order does not have any rules. If at all it has got, it is actually exempting the superpower from any kind of rules. So therefore, and it, there is no universality of the rules that we are talking of. It is India which is actually walking the talk and preaching what it practices, whether it is Vasudeva Kutumbakam or it is diplomacy and dialogue. I think the time has come that India is actually asserting its self-confidence. Uh, resurgent India is actually showing its might and strength to the world order and opening up the eyes of the people who have no character, who have no principles, who have no rules. They themselves, they set the rules for the world. They don't practice themselves. I think it's, it's a clear indication of India bouncing back to its resurgent status of the civilizational era. Back to you, Uday. Yes, uh, let me, uh, you know, take that uh, to uh, Major Katoch. And obviously, there is an opportunity now to take these relations forward. Prime Minister Modi will be in Qatar later this week. Perhaps there will be dialogue and uh, conversations at the highest level uh, this week as well, Major Katoch. Oh, well, there's already uh, just a few days ago, a $78 billion deal has been announced mm. uh, as far as uh, import uh, of LNG gas is concerned. <laughs> And um, that, I think, it's set with a very positive step. So, uh, any deal to be announced, I don't think uh, the Qataris will be too interested in uh, uh, imports from India. Uh, what, but we will be interested in energy products as far as Qatar is concerned. And uh, they can even set up their establishments, uh, 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 you know, fund certain enterprises within India. Um, 
this is the right time to do it because uh, please remember even countries like qatar are looking for places where they can park their funds uh, the dollar uh, well they, they can park it in dollar terms but the dollar over a period of time is on the way out and i think uh, the rupee indian rupee will be a reasonably stable currency in the years to come so when they are looking forward um, looking to the future uh, either they can deal in gold or they can deal in indian rupees but investing in india i think is going to be a very profitable um, uh, a very pro- pro- a profitable proposition for them what will they discuss what will the prime minister discuss i think those discussions that have already taken place you know it, it isn't that the prime minister goes there and starts a discussion uh, over the last 6 months or one year a whole lot of paid work would have been done so if any deal has to be signed it will be signed based on those uh, based on what has been discussed but in my, in my but in my view it will be restricted to energy uh, i don't see anything else happening uh, at this moment uday all right let me uh, in fact uh, take that across to sumit peer as well sumit uh, uh what what do you expect from the pm's visit and also uh which way forward for india qatari relations also this pm's middle east policy approach certainly has reaped dividends hasn't it see oday uh, the prime minister's middle east policy has changed the paradigm you're seeing a temple a bhavya mandir come up in abu dhabi or dubai which was unseen unheard of unpredictable that is happening and the honorable prime minister is going to be tomorrow and the inauguration was 14th now you have more than 60 70000 people which are going to do in this uh, which are going to come for, to meet the prime minister which is again a landmark even for the for the leaders of the islamic world to get 100000 people in one place to meet is, is something difficult so prime minister modi getting the highest civilian awards from the islamic world is there we have entered 40000 diaspora today we, qatar is we are the third biggest market for the only product of qatar that is this lng gas now qatar is not a very powerful economy it is has a gdp of around 380 billion dollars but the population is very small so even in the long run now we have got a plant opened in africa which mr puri inaugurated again a 20 billion dollar deal india is also trying to diversify it so qatar needs india for its third biggest market for lng exports which might become number 2 in the world and 840000 indians which literally run qatar imagine if india moves out of the market and the 840000 indians are no longer there you can imagine what will happen to the country of qatar today 22% of the qatar is indians and 15% of the qatari population is hindu let me remind you so qatar has to also see its ways how do they want to handle india because india is not a <clears throat> छोटा मोटा टिनी मनी कंट्री सवेर आईलैंड सवेर यू यू नो यू कैन हैंडल एज पर योर विम्स एंड फैंसीज गॉन आर दोज डेज दे नो द क्लाउड ऑफ इंडिया दे नो द पावर ऑफ इंडिया दे नो दे नीड इंडिया मोर देन वी नीड कतार बिकॉज इवेंचुअली वेन यू आर मूविंग टू ईवीज एंड टूडे आई वॉज रीचिंग दैट यू नो न्यू ऑटोमोबाइल मैनुफेक्चर आर मैनुफेक्चरिंग दीज हाइड्रोजन सेल बेस्ड इंजन विच इज ऑलरेडी हैपन टूडे so eventually the qatar has to also see where it is going to fend you know and we are supplying all the food and all the items to qatar so then you might have all the oil and gas in the world but reet nahi kha sakte na you need wheat and uh, chawal you can't eat uh, reet you got to eat sand so we have our place we have our stature it is better qatar understands us and i think one message is also given to qatar is don't get into these gimmicks you cannot get hold of indian people and think that indian veterans are pawns which you can use in your game of geopolitics to please you know some pakistanis or iranis or maybe turks or whatever if there's a flawed case which has built against india this is your problem you allowed it to happen this is your mistake our people do not do espionage and our people do not go with a rank and a title and do espionage then suddenly you wake up one day by yahudo ki ke, ke, ke liye jasusi kar rahe the what is this happening this is mockery we are not somalia you have to treat us with respect you need our people good you don't need it's okay but these kind of games india is tired of i think the message is very clear you want trade you want relation it is mutual respect mutual dignity and mutual trust if you are willing to walk the talk it's okay else today india has options we can survive with or without you is we are not a country where you know our people are sending us money like pakistan and we are surviving by by on those states and bits no india is not a country it has to be a relation of mutual trust and brotherhood so that is the time and these kind of fiascos should not happen because people out of india and people within india will try to take advantage of this we don't want government of qatar to create these fiascos for us we are not into espionage we don't do it for mossad mossad is good enough even to know you know how many how many cousin brothers or uh, cousin sisters will the amir have which are of course undeclared so i will i'll rest my case there so don't don't, don't expect ki mossad will outsource the tender to us and unhone ek tender nikala tha we were the l1 then we got a we got a omni guy involved and omni guy got a indian naval officers involved then he went to qatar then we did the espionage then omni guy himself and our officers are there i mean yaar 
It's a Alice in Wonderland story. I mean, which kind of a sane government believes in all this crap? I mean, did we apply for a tender when Mossad is giving tenders for espionage and we were the L1? I mean, this is absurd. This is theater of absurd. So people in the Middle East have to get it. It's not only Israel, it's only India who can also major and get its people back. I was always telling on every media, we will get our people back safe and sound. It's a matter of time. Balbi baka ni yoga. That is the message which should go to everybody. Indian lives matter. And especially when our Fogis, when our veterans, if we they are assets of India. And you cannot handle assets of India where on your whims and fancies. If you have some you know geopolitical ambitions and attitudes, keep them with you. But trade will happen on mutual respect, mutual dignity, and mutual trust. That is the message loud and clear. Byapar to achhi baat hai. We are all for trade, but not at a compromise. Okay. Uh, Comrade Anil Jain Singh, I'll leave the last word to you. I think what has happened is, I know all this, we've had a lot of rhetorical discussion this evening, but finally the bottom line is, our veterans are back safe and sound. Uh, India has proven its, its uh, diplomatic uh, dexterity, our political clout, uh, I would again not use the word cloud, but a political heft. So these are all things which have, and and I think it's been a very well coordinated uh, approach towards getting these people back. There has been a lot of back channel diplomacy. You know, when this case happened initially, the death sentence was announced by the by the lowest court. But prior to that, the general impression was that there is no case because, like has been brought out, there was no espionage. There was nothing to prove that there was anything of the sort. So the assumption was there is no case. It is obviously being done at the behest of somebody, so this will just fall apart. But when the death sentence was announced, I think that was really a clarion call for, for the establishment to sit up and take notice and say, now this is getting serious. And we have to do something really, you know, we have to take some serious steps to ensure that uh, our people don't come to any harm. And these are very respectable, uh, professionally qualified, highly respected uh, senior naval veterans. They were not some, some, you know, people from just picked up from here and there. And like Sumit brought out, why would the Mossad ask us to do their espionage? They're, a, they're, a, they're the world's leading uh, spy agency. So I think all told, finally, the bottom line is our people are back safe and sound. The government of India has stood by our veterans. Uh, it's done a remarkable, I think, job. And it speaks, it augurs also well for indo qatari relations with the Prime Minister going there next week. It, that relationship will start off on a much, much shorter footing than it would have had this sort of cloud been hanging over this relationship during his visit. All okay. right, uh, let's uh, leave it at that. Uh, my thanks to all of our guests for joining us on this discussion. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.